uh, Nano, as uh, most of us uh, now know, is a network of uh, past and present. Uh, an NF Pogo, Nippon Foundation, Pogo scholars, and in dif different uh, that participated or are currently involved in um, Pogo organized and uh, Nippon Foundation funded uh, projects and training um, trainings all over uh, different areas of the global uh, ocean. And uh, uh, now a little bit about the Nano Global Project. Um, actually, the idea of the Nano Global Project uh, comes in line with the beliefs of the Nippon Foundation and the and Pogo uh, and their uh, Nano so network of uh, scholars. Uh, considers that understanding of the ocean and coastal environment relies on integrated observation system around the world. So between 2012 and 2017, there was uh, the uh, uh, NFPOGO funded uh, nano regional research projects uh, that gathered uh, members from nano members and nano friends from different institutions and uh, several backgrounds. And uh, some of the projects, uh, the regional projects, tackled coastal monitoring of different subjects like uh, HABs and uh, tides and currents, erosion or exotic species invasion. Ultimately applying uh, ocean observation techniques for societal benefits. So the Nano Global Project started off in 2017 with a kickoff meeting in Lisbon in April last year. And uh, uh, since then, the, uh, uh, the, uh, I would say the uh, objectives of the global project uh, are uh, in bullet points uh, briefly uh, to support institute in measurements of uh, selected essential oceanographic variables or basic oceanographic variables, such as uh, uh, temperature, uh, salinity, um, dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, and so on. Uh, also, uh, one of the main objectives is to compile data contributed by the participants in this project, which will pave the way to construct a nano global database of selected EOVs and also provide capacity building along the way and opportunities to the participants to this project and to the broader uh, also nano community that has uh, that can have uh, the same interest as the nano global project to have trainings on marine data and observation and data analysis methods. And uh, uh, finally, also to encourage uh, comparative studies between the project study sites around the world. So to compare, um, for instance, levels of acidification or levels of, uh, of deoxygenation around several areas of the, the coastal ocean. And uh, also, and this has been um, an important part of the Nano Global Project, or at least we're trying to make it uh, stronger uh, to initiate and support outreach and citizen science, uh, science activities to raise awareness about the importance of marine environment and the threats that is facing it. So that's a uh, uh, little bit an introduction to the Nano Global Project and I hope that this uh, webinar series would draw more attention and we can get more Nano members involved in. So, hey, thank you, Hussam. So, thank you all for the invitation of coming here today. And so, I think I think we should start as time is passing fast. I'm trying to share my screen with you guys over there. Yes, it's working. I will do this. I'm gonna change here. Okay, I think you, you got it, isn't it? Can you see the slides? Yes, it's clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hussein. So I'll start with the question what brings me here today. 
you've been following that uh, in the last years, <clears throat> a huge development. Uh, have been focused on improving remote sensing of water color in coastal and other optically complex bodies of water, such as inland waters. However, we should consider that remote sensing of oceanic waters is much more mature and robust comparatively to coastal and more complex waters. So the basic idea here is to comment on some important or basic theoretical concepts about distillation of chlorophyll color concentration and surface temperature by satellite, also mentioning some data sources, processing software, and of course about Giovanni itself. So I'm going to present you some background, very basic background and theoretical concepts in remote sensing, satellite estimation of chlorophyll concentration and sea surface temperature, a list of data sources and other software, and about Giovanni. So first question is, is what is remote sensing? Sorry for the more educated people, but uh, as I teach here in the graduate program of remote sensing at TIMP, this is when you, you type using Google, one of the first links that you're going to show up, besides the announcements, advertisements and so on, is, 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 is a, a slide like this. And uh, this is important just to show that you can have also, uh, independent of the definition you're going to use for remote sensing, of course, but there are two basic types of approaches, which the upper level one shows the using the passive sensors, meaning the visible and the infrared. And another one is using active sensors, such as LiDAR and uh, radar. But uh, the basic concept is that we have an electromagnetic radiation, which is going to rely on a source. And uh, passive sensors, the source is going to be the sunlight, of course. And for radars, it's going to be an antenna or something like that. Then we have a sensor, which in our case is a remote an orbital sensor, and our object of study. <clears throat> Here you have the electromagnetic spectrum screen taken from a book written by Professor Jan Robinson. And, uh, and you can see all the wavelengths. And uh, we use to divide uh, the spectrum in, uh, in regions uh, where we've been relying our efforts, such as the UV, visible, near infrared, thermal infrared, and microwaves. And in the middle of the screen, you can see the class of sensors that you usually call them or techniques such as ocean color radiometers, infrared radiometers, microwave radiometers, and radars. And today, I'm going to be mentioning the three of those, which are the ocean color radiometers, infrared radiometers, and passive microwave radiometers. And already here, you can see, and besides the wavelengths, you also have the frequencies, the right side, the opposite, they're inversely correlated and it's important to take uh, note that the atmosphere is not totally transparent this electromagnetic radiation so we need to rely our our sensors our bands where we have the atmospheric windows that means where the radiation is not being blocked by the atmosphere itself or by the constituents of the atmosphere such as water vapor or water itself if you wish uh, carbon dioxide, ozone, and, and, and so on, okay? So if, if, if you take a look on this, on this picture, you see that, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my cursor over there, then you can see what is the radiation above the atmosphere, and down here in red, you see the radiation at sea level. And all these features on this are related to absorption bands of the atmospheric constituents. So, and here again, you have UV, the visible and infrared, and you can see that the peak is in the visible region of the spectrum. Well, here I, I like to summarize I mean, the basic physical principles of remote sensing, only with this picture here. Sorry for just simplifying that so much. But here you have the function of this curve is, the, uh, is determined by Planck's law. The area or the integral of the curve is determined by Stefan Boltzmann law. And the peak of emission, if you derive Planck's law, you're gonna have this peak which is determined by Wien's law, displacement field law. So that's all about it. Okay, now talking about the remote sensing process itself, it's important to realize that all the information you can get from ocean phenomena comes from a field of view or an instantaneous field of view. And, and you're going to interact with the atmosphere.
atmosphere. Also, it's gonna have contributions from not interesting signals into the orbital sensor, okay? So this data, we're gonna be transmitted. Hi, Lick over there. The data will be transmitted to a ground station and the, the ground station is gonna release what is called raw data or also data CADU. And this data is gonna be processed. So that's what we call image processing or digital image processing until you get a measurement or an estimate of a notion of phenomenon or variable. And of course, you're gonna to have to deal with different steps from calibration to atmospheric correction and to inferring uh, what is uh, wanted information. It's important also to realize that orbital sensors, they have different resolutions in terms of spatial, spectral, radiometric, and temporal, where spatial refers to the pixel size, Spectral refers to bandwidth or spectral range of the channels is going to be available. Radiometric refers to sensitivity, number of bits of the sensors to register your information or a signal, which in, in, in true is radiance. And the temporal resolution refers to the period of time between collection of data on the same pixel or area, if you wish. Also, it's important to have in mind that from the raw data to geophysical parameters, you have different levels of data processing. So from level zero, we go to level one, where we're gonna apply calibrations to the sensor and also positional registration. Then you go to atmospheric correction to get into level 1A. And after that, you're gonna really apply your algorithms or models to estimate your geophysical parameters that's going to be available on level two already. And you build composites in terms of space and time compositions, you're going to have level three data. And level four data is going to be when you wear different sensors, you merge them, or you add other ancillary data, modeling such as primary production estimates, for example. So we're going to have level four uh, data. Data is processed and delivered in different formats. Historically, we've been using HDF, which means hierarchical data format. And we've been processing this kind of data using different packages, such as IDL, MATLAB, all those commercial ones, Octave and other free software or open source. Also, HDF Explorer also was a routine and all the expertise about the HDF uh, hierarchical data format files. And more recently, the community had changed to be adopting NetCDF formats. But for GIS community, they rely very much on GeoTIFF, but there are many other formats also available nowadays. In terms of calibrations, as you probably know, oceanographic instrumentation must, must be routinely calibrated. So the same for onboard satellite sensors. They must be calibrated before the launchment and during in-orbit operation. So this, is, this relies on reference targets, calibrated lamps, black bodies, and it's important to detect uh, drifts of the sensors for proper corrections. Also, some satellite sensors, they also can make maneuvers for moon and sun viewing. But another important approach is to do vicarious calibration, which is the comparison of what you've been getting on board the satellites with in situ measurements. So, such as an example is using data from buoys such as MOBI and so on. Here we have a big picture of different types of sensors, usually used in satellite oceanography. So, we have here passive and active sensors. You are not going to deal with active sensors today, only with passive sensors, especially in the visible infrared and passive microwave. And here we have different types, as I mentioned before, scanners or radiometers most of them in our case today. And the primary observable quantity, which is ocean color, sea surface temperature for today, and derived variables of interest, we'll be talking about chlorophyll and sea surface temperature. So now how can we estimate chlorophyll concentration with ocean color remote sensing? So this is a very basic approach, started in the 70s and 80s. And where those authors you can see on the screen, they, they have shown that it's possible to quantify uh, phytoplanktonic biomass indexed by chlorophyll concentration with a notion color radiometer. So photosynthetic pigments, mainly chlorophyll A, absorb solar radiation differently in different wavelengths, such as the blue and red, 
and does not absorb in the green. So chlorophyll A concentration is used as an index of phytoplankton biomass, biomass. Although you should comment that the relation between carbon chlorophyll, cellular carbon chlorophyll is not as stable as you would like to, to have. So here you have like a, a schematic diagram showing that you, you have wavelengths and here like the strength of signal, energy, or whatever you want, even radiance. <clears throat> And you have different chlorophyll concentrations increasing down here. And those are the, the curves or the spectral signatures of different chlorophyll concentrations. And you see that in the blue, when you, there is an inverse correlation, when, when you increase chlorophyll concentration, you decrease the strength of energy in the blue. So we can already have a linear relationship or an inverse relationship between blue and chlorophyll concentration. However, there are some noises and atmospheric interferences, as I've already mentioned, and I talk more about later. And so, <clears throat> we decided, the community decided to use a, a ratio, an index. And you can see that in the green region, you don't have such correlation or variation uh, with, of uh, chlorophyll concentration against uh, the signal, uh, the spectral signature in the green. So, we use the ratio blue-green, so as you're going to rely on the inverse correlation of blue and chlorophyll, and, but not having this in the green, you're going to be able to cancel uh, all the uh, environmental interference on, on this approach. So the phytoplankton biomass here is computed as a color index. And the principle, as I mentioned before, mentioned before is that light absorption curve of chlorophyll. Here on the right, you can see that there is a strong peak of absorption in the blue and a smaller peak in the red. However, the red light does not penetrate very deeply into the water column, but the blue and the green yes, and not much variation in the green. And those are one of the peak graphics from one of the former uh, student, students. And here you have, I mean, one of the basic uh, or first uh, graphs taken from CCCS uh, science team on that time, the 80s, showing that the blue-green ratio of water leaving radiance against global concentration is very linear and could be approached as an empirical model. So that was the big beginning of this story. But however, what you get on the sensor is not only the signal from chlorophyll, phytoplankton chlorophyll, you can get signal from inorganic suspended material, the organic material, even from the sea bottom if the water column is clear and not very deep, if it's shallow. Also other information from the atmosphere itself, some glitch with specular reflection on surface and so on. And it's important to have in mind about these concepts of case one and case two waters, where case one waters are characterized by the spectral signatures de derived or influenced mainly or only by phytoplankton and all the op other optical active constituents, the covariate of phytoplankton, which is not the case for case two waters. And here you have like a picture of what's going on in terms of atmosphere. And you can see from here that what really matters is the signal emerging or being upwelled from the water column in, inside the instantaneous field of view of the sensor and reaches the orbital center. So how to calculate the chlorophyll concentration? Basically, there are two kinds, two main types of algorithms or models, if you wish. The first one is the pyricons that I have shown in the graph before. And usually you take only one parameter, such as chlorophyll, for example, and band ratios of different types. There are many already published in the literature. And the same analytic ones, which you can get or derive different variables optical properties at the same time simultaneously. Although, of course, you're going to have to do uh, radioactive transfer modeling and solving a more complicated algorithm. But there are also many more, such as phytoplankton functional types or particle size distribution models and so on. So here I have a schematic diagram showing that what you get on satellites are radiance or reflectance, remote sensing reflectance or marine reflectance, if you wish, and those are called apparent optical properties. If you apply same analytic algorithms, you're going to derive inherent optical properties, such as absorption and scattering coefficients. If you apply empirical models, you're going to have in water constituents, such as chlorophyll concentration, for example, suspended sediments concentration, sedum, and so on. 
And it's important to realize that local parameterization for coastal and in inland waters are, are a must or is a must. You have like also a schematic graph of what we call global standard algorithm for chlorophyll. On the black line, you're gonna have this algorithm or model delivered from the agencies. And those are based in simple seven points, those uh, black crosses here. But, and here we have the blue-green ratio and here chlorophyll concentration. But here on this, this color blue circles, you see that this is my own data. So I've got this data from my study region. And for, for medium values of chlorophyll, they fit quite well into the global algorithm. But, but for, for example, for low values of chlorophyll, they, they don't fit inside, they, they are outside. So this is showing you that maybe a regional algorithm, for example, it's just a linear regression here, a linear field, maybe you're gonna correlate better the blue-green ratio algorithm with chlorophyll in situ. So this is showing some, but for some times the global or standard algorithm is gonna work properly for our study area. From the IUCCG side, which means that International Ocean Color Coordination Group, you can have a list of current ocean color sensors also a list of historical sensors and, and also schedule sensors, if you wish, with the agencies in charge of them, sensors on board which satellites, launch dates, SWAT, which is the area being viewed by the satellite, spatial resolutions, number of bands, spectral coverage, and so on. The Ocean Color Web, maintained by GSC at NASA, is a very important source of data, information, documentation, software and tools. And talking about tools, CEDAS is, I think, is the most used software for image processing for this phase, for this types of application. And you can rely on a forum where people can uh, open their questions, change ideas, and get useful information. So I strongly recommend you to try to use that if you wish. But there are other softwares such as Beam and Snap from, from ESA and Copernicus, Odessa, Bilco, and, and a few other ones. And in truth, see and Snap, also Beam, they're talking very much together. So there is a convergence for this and it's very useful for the community. And here you have a list of other data sources and useful information related, let's say, to chlorophyll concentration or ocean color, if you wish. Okay, from ESA and uh, also from uh, private companies and Geo Planet and Geo Aqua Watch. So I suggest you take a look into this. Now talking about satellite derived sea surface temperature, this is a technique uh, being used since the 60s, considering that uh, orbital sensors, they can provide you a very large spatial coverage with a very good temporal resolution. You can get synoptic views for global mapping even for remote or poor sample regions, such as the middle of South Atlantic, for example. Accuracy, accuracies, they vary from a few tens of degrees, and, but biggest limitation is cloud coverage as well as for ocean color. It is important to realize that sea surface temperature estimated with infrared radiometers or even passive microwave radiometers, they, they are really related to very shallow layer in the case of infrared radiometry, it's only a few micrometers, and for microwave, a few millimeters. And what you call the book or a DEA for a normal system as temperature, taking with a buoy, a bucket, or any other kind of drifter, or a CPB, it comes from a few meters there. And much more information about this you can get from the Grista group, okay? So what's happened with the sea surface in the thermal infrared? You can see here, that for wavelengths lower than around five or four something micrometers, solar radiation is dominant. And for higher wavelengths, that Earth's radiation is, is dominant. There is a region here where you have a confusion. During the day, you're gonna have emission emitted, reflected by the Earth. Yeah? So you must take care of these wavelengths. Those are used for fires, for example. But you'll be working here for the visible and here for the thermal infrared. And basically everybody with a, an absolute temperature higher than zero degrees Kelvin, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, emits electromagnetic radiation, also called a thermal emission, and can be considered as a source of radiation. 
The electromagnetic radiation propagates in a waveform, and all wavelengths travel the same speed, which is the speed of light. And sea surface temperatures is obtained from the radiation which is emitted and not reflected by the water in the thermal infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the orbital sensor measures basically radiance, L, of a surface. And by definition, radiance is the radiant flux per unit solid angle emitted by a surface in a given direction. For infrared emission, sea surface can be considered almost Lambertian. That means uniform radius in all directions. So therefore, we have that the radiance equals energy, excitance, emittance per wavelength divided by pi. According to the Planck's law, you're going to have this equation here, where the energy is related to two constants, the wavelength where we are working in, in the thermal infrared, and temperature. And this is what you call brightness temperature in degrees Kelvin. Now you need to relate this excitance or emittance with radiance. And then you have what is emissivity. Emissivity is a dimension, just a relation of a ratio of the energy provided, emitted by a real surface, such as the surface, and an ideal surface, such as a black body. And for the ocean, this is much higher than 0.98, which is almost one, which simplifies very much our life. It is different for, for example, land surface temperatures, where emissivity is going to vary with different targets or surface or substance. Emissivity does not vary with temperature, but with the nature of the surface. So now that you can relate, and of course, if you invert the Planck's law, you're going to get the temp brightness temperature as a function of excitance, and you can get excitance from radiance. So to calculate the real or the sea surface temperature, not the brightness temperature, you're going to rely on algorithms, empirical algorithms, which are going to correlate what you want to get, which is the sea surface temperature, against the brightness temperatures in such infrared bands, such as 11 microns and 12 microns. And those algorithms are known as split window algorithms because you take the thermal infrared window in between 10 and 12 micrometers into two channels, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, approximately. And this is called multi-channel sea surface temperature or also non-linear sea surface temperatures. And there are, of course, a few others. And here we have like an interesting list of data sources and useful information about sea surface temperature from another NASA centers, data centers, so that the one in JPL, Ocean Color also provides you surface temperature data. Giovanni, you're gonna see a little bit more later, the Pathfinder, and uh, there are many others, University of Hawaii, NOAA here, and also some literature where you can get more information, theoretical background if you wish. Now going to a uh, surface temperature in the passive microwaves is very similar to what you have seen for the thermal infrared, although in, for longer wavelengths. So the advantage here of using this kind of wavelengths is that clouds are transparent, almost transparent. So we trans can see this through the clouds. However, it's subject to errors related to variations in wind speed, sea surface foam coverage, and rain. And also, the resolution and accuracy of uh, sea surface temperature estimates using those wavelengths are relatively lower than in the thermal infrared range due to lower signal strength in this range. If you take the Planck's law, you can easily see that. And here you have a comparison provided by Gary Rick from NOAA. In the left, you have uh, thermal infrared sensors, such as the AVHR, which is flying nowadays on MetOp European satellites, although AVHR is a NOAA sensor. And you can see that the bias of in situ buoy sea surface temperature measures against those is almost zero. And but the bias is a little bit higher, and bias means here the difference when you get a passive microwave radiometer. Briefly comparing those two, you can see that in the thermal infrared, you're going to get a better spatial resolution from 1 to 10 kilometers, while for microwave, you're going to get a quarter of a degree as the best. Precision in terms of by pixel is also a few tenths of degrees, and here is half degree accuracy. It's lower than 0.1 Kelvin and crucial field tens. Limitations for thermal infrared is cloud coverage and for passive microwaves is rain, surface roughness generated by wind, 
Also, we cannot get data so close to the coast and ice, so from 15 to even 50 kilometers, depending on the region, also some radio frequency difference. Temporal resolution could be much higher for thermal infrared, especially in considering geostationary satellites. As you probably know, there are two main types of orbits of satellites around the, the Earth. Uh, one of them is geostationary and the other one is polar. So with polar, we can get two times per day at least, but as you have more satellites operating simultaneously, of course, you get much more data than all of this. But for geostationary satellites, such as GOES and Metasat and many other ones in Maui, you're going to have every hour, half an hour, even 15 minutes. And time series are longer, starts in the 80s and here, end of night. And just a basic picture is an old one, but uh, the one that could get so to make the comparison, simultaneous comparison from the same period of time. In the upper level, you can see thermal infrared, and in the lower panel, you can see. Uh, passive microwaves, and you can see this, uh, those white uh, popcorn here are related to cloud coverage. Well, here you have a smaller data list of data sources and new information for uh, passive microwave. Uh, remote sensing is, uh, is an interesting site where you can get data and information, also from different sensors such as MSR, MSRE, MSR2 from S data, where it's also used for uh, Giovanni, Coast Watch from NOAA, and OZISA from Elmetsat in Europe. Now, going to Giovanni, uh, it's important to notice that nowadays, or for some, sometimes recently, we are being asked to register. It's, it's, it's an easy process, but that's a must, so we have to register. And then you're gonna get this type of screens where it's you can get in here, but uh, seeing as your operation will be very limited. So, and, and sorry, if, if you click on this 4.31, which is the version, present version, you can have all the release notes for this and the previous ones. And there's also a user guide where you can follow and test as a training, if you wish. We're gonna show all the uh, options and tools you have available on the interface, which is, very intuitive and easy to use and the amount of data being added is amazing is is, is very interesting for so for teaching for exploratory studies for example for testing an hypothesis without using much time for data processing downloading and so on or data downloading and processing and analysis you can try to use giovanni and similar tools okay here I have a few examples before jumping into the, the real thing. But this is a time series of area average difference from 2002 to 2019 of Moody's Walk of sea surface temperature at 4 microns, night only. Remember, I mentioned around 4 microns, you have emitted and reflected energy during the day. So not it's tricky to use the information during the day. So night is okay because you only have emitted radiation, so no, no mistakes. And uh, so, and, but this is a difference in between. This is a temperature calculated in four microns and 11 microns. And you see that the, the variation is a few uh, tens of degrees, but in, in varies of time. So, because users, they came to me and asking, which CSF temperature should I use? Daytime or nighttime? 11 microns, four microns. So this could be tricky, but you, you have the tools to, to see by yourself and make your best choice. And here we have like a time series of an area average of chlorophyll concentration with a four kilometer resolution of Modis Waka data level three from 2002 to 2019, very recently for a certain region in the southwestern South Atlantic. And, and you can see those are monthly composites and you can also add a, a line or a tendency line and you can see some peaks and you can make a lot of studies. Let's write online. But before jumping to there, let me just mention that there are also other tools I'd like to mention. We've been now strongly suggesting and also motivating our students, graduate students, to use Google Earth Engine, GA. It's also, you're going to have to register, but very easy process. And this is a, I, I make it available, just a few code lines. Here we can load color field data from Moji's Aqua from 2010 to 2014 and you can create a time series chart. So very similar to the one I have shown before using Giovanni, but then here you 
this Uganda process this in the cloud. So it's also very interesting, very powerful. And but if you're a geek guy and wants to build whatever you want, do whatever you want, not using only the data which is available on those tools, you can also go for Python. So we've been teaching Python here in Jupyter and Anaconda interfaces. And here you have an example, a few code lines for selecting a view and CDF file. I'm not going through all of this, but I'll make it available and also strongly recommend you uh, to make an effort and try to use those. And another option for manipulating that CDF data, because of course everyone usually have an environment, computation environment where they feel comfortable to do their analysis. So the thing is to get the data <clears throat> and select your region of interest, sometimes saving another format, so as go to your comfort zone. So there is also CBO, which is the Climate Data Operators for a Max Planck Institute in Germany, and also very common and used to teach it here. And finally, of course, MATLAB, we also have an example of two code lines of reading net CDF files. So, so here I have Giovanni now, and you should start, so, first of all, I, I would say that you should define what variables you are going to work with. So let's say sea surface temperature. Okay, and see the research. And here you have mode is level three, of course. I'm in a hurry. I know I speak too fast. My English is not perfect. I've got I am in a code, sorry for that. <clears throat> but I can mention at least, you allow me to lie a little bit that you know already what is level three, which what is mode is aqua, is surface temperature, and this is a version of the processing because the data, the products is remote sensing products are routinely being reprocessed. So keep an eye on that. It's important to use the last collection of data. And those are monthly average. And down here, we have the same data, level three modes aqua, same collection, same spatial resolution, but uh, as a temporal resolution of eight days. So we can see here that you don't have better resolution than four kilometers. If you want to work with four kilometers, I would rec strongly recommend to go to the Color website or Try another one, such as Google Engine or Python, wherever you want. Those are 11 microns at night. Those are 11 microns. This is 11 microns at day. And also here, eight days and monthly. And you have also four microns at night and four microns at nine, eight days. So let's take as an example, monthly average of sea surface temperature, 11 at night. And the period of time, I will make it simple for 2018, just to save time. Because, and you can type your area of interest following this uh, order from west, south corner, east, and north corners. You can also open a map, and I would, I would drag a different region. Uh, sorry for that. So this is the Atlantic, you know, South Atlantic. I'm going to the southwest and South Atlantic, where I live, where I'm is it now? Okay, this is Cape Frio. So we, I will choose a smaller area here. Let me check. Oh, sorry, Did a mistake. Oh, this is Guanabara Bay. This is Sao Paulo State. Okay, and uh, and so automatically it gets the limits border from my my study area over there as an example and there are different times of law so i have chosen the variable i have chosen the period of time the area of interest and there are different plots you should start with a simple time series you're gonna be the area average so the sea surface temperature monthly average for that area you can also type it as an area such as a point almost a point or a few pixels if you wish uh, okay but let's try with this area and I click on plot data. If the area is not too big and the period of time is not that big, this won't take much time. But if you take the whole, let's say, Modis Vaqua data range, which is from second semester of 2002 to last month, it will take more time, of course. That's why I have chosen you a few graphs before. So hopefully, it won't take too much time. It's already finishing hopefully 
and you're gonna see a graph very similar to the one I have shown you before. And there will be some uh, options for you to replot, change a few things. You, and of course, you can see the graph as a PNG file as it is. Here it is. So you can save it as it is. Okay, uh, save the data. You have also to change the takeout. Sorry, maybe save. Yeah, I, I don't want. So you can take out the title or leave it, the caption or leave it. And we also have some options here for replot. Replotting, for example, can fit the line. You can change minimum and maximum, for example. And then press replot. You see, very fast and easy. And of course, but let me say you are interested in getting the data. So if you, if you came to download, you see that you can get, as a, can get the data as an HP comma separated variable, an Excel file. Yeah? You can open every text editor or editor or spreadsheet. You can, you're going to get this data or, or, or the, the figure, the graph itself. Okay? And now let's go back to data selection. Let's try another one. Uh, for example, area differences, uh, as I, I have shown you before, or instead of this, let's let's take a map, time average map. Okay, here it is. Now, uh, let's try chlorophyll search. Okay, so though, let me take this out. So total chlorophyll from, this is a, a data get from model. OCTS is another ocean color sensor. And uh, months or daily data, you can have fluorescence line height. I didn't mention about this, but that's another type of algorithm where we relate fluorescence or the height of the fluorescence curve with chlorophyll concentration. Here we have Moji's Aqua level three monthly average of chlorophyll, eight days average. Uh, <clears throat> and you also have other ocean core products. Uh, we're not supposed to be talking very much about it, but there is no other way as they are being shown here, such as particulate organic carbon and absorption coefficients due, phytoplan due to phytoplankton, AP. Particulate backscattering coefficient, BDP, and, and, and a few others. Uh, the orthotic data taken from QA, uh, from Zhongping Li algorithm. Data from CWIPS, not only from MODIS, which is another ocean color sensor from before the MODIS, if you are aware of. So let's take it the same as chlorophyll concentration, mostly average here. Okay. So what else? The same period. Mm. Okay, and plot the data. Oh, let me do it simpler. Take months. So you see, it's, it's very intuitive. So you choose your variable, you can type in, you can also, I'll show later on, on the left, you can, from disciplines or from sensors, you can choose whatever variable parameter or the most sensing product if you wish you want to plot and you have uh, some or a few options for different plots and you can if you're not interested really in the plots you can just pick those variables uh, and to download them very easily and fast and and you can go to python matlab excel like wherever you wish r sorry mentioned that before so you see this is a map an average map and uh, I can see the whole screen, or there are some options. For example, you can have a title, caption, legend, support new release. Mm -hmm. Much better, isn't it? So <clears throat> you can have here, like this is the legend, okay? 
or the lookup table of values. So you can have the coastlines, the countries, the grid, if you wish or not, and so on. Okay, and you can download the image or you can download the data, as I mentioned before. Now, what else? You can uh, make comparisons, for example. Uh, that's interesting, a map correlation, for example. Um, let me put sea surface, sea surface temperature back to this. I know my time is almost finishing, for example. Uh, so I have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is taken, is derived from day image, of course. So let me take 11 micro from the day. And let me use this and let me plot this data. So I am building a map correlation in between sea surface temperature and chlorophyll concentration for the same study area. Sorry for not changing the area, but just not spend time with that. And you see, let's see what's going to happen. So that region is not a, an upwelling region, but mostly in the southwest or, or southeast coast of Brazil, we should expect an, an inverse correlation between sea surface temperature and chlorophyll, which means that considering that this is a very levotrophic area, dominated Brazil current, so we don't have many nutrients, not a very productive area. So you can see that many areas you can have an inverse correlation, negative correlation, what that means. <coughs> so that's what I was saying, that nutrients, they can come with uh, upwelling or advection of colder and richer waters into the region. And this is going to increase phytoplankton biomass in the excess and chlorophyll concentration. So that's what you got this picture. But you can make correlations in between two different sensors of chlorophyll to see how do they behave. For example, as I mentioned before, Suhir was flying from 1997 to 2010 and, and Moji's from 2002 up to today, let's say you want to merge or to use the data. So you want to see during the time they've been operating simultaneously, how do they correlate, for example. You also can make different types of correlation and observations, quite interesting. If you go back, I was mentioning that you can go through disciplines, you can, let me take those out, and uh, from platforms and instruments, spatial resolution. If I take this out, am I, am I clear this? Uh, so I go back. So you have, in terms of disciplines, atmospheric, ocean biology, oceanography, which we've been dealing here. And of course, you have some uh, superposition here, same variables in two disciplines. The measurements, atmospheric ones, even atmospheric chemistry, which is Quite interesting to take a look. Methane, carbon dioxide, black carbon, and uh, you see also physical drivers and heat flux. Uh, mixed layer the after model, of course. Ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, you see the, the huge yes, and you can also pick wind. And you can also go through platforms and instruments, if you wish, or spatial resolutions, temporal resolutions, and so on. So it's a very rich and interesting database. Uh, I think that we won't have much time to show you all which is available, but I show that how easy this could be to, to play with if you're not accustomed to. And I prefer now to keep the, uh, to pass forward for you guys to mention whatever you want, and I open for questions. So thank you very much. So now I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll give the floor the word or it will send. Hi, Lucho, how are you doing there? Good to see you. So, okay, Hussein, so are you there? No, he le ah, no, he's here. So, Hussein, that's what I have to present for today. So I'm very open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Milton, for this uh, great presentation. Very uh, deep and very detailed, but yet, uh, very well presented, so I think anyone with basic oceanographic background can uh, touch a lot from your, and have a lot of take home messages from your presentation. So thank you again, and uh, now I'll turn to the participants. If anyone has any comment, any question, 
anything that uh, Milton can help with or so please uh, uh, show yourself. I, I would like to mention just that the slides will be available for you guys, okay? Hi, Milton. It's Pri here. Let um, me turn on the camera. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. It was really, really good. Uh, I was wondering, it's, uh, Giovanni is a, is a great tool, and I, I wonder why I don't use it more often to, like, if you want to have a quick access to what's happening somewhere, it's really, really great. And I was wondering something, is, is there anyone looking at the impact of the smoke on the phytoplankton in the South Atlantic? Because I was wondering, like, that's probably a massive amount of iron and dust, you know, going to the ocean. And maybe Giovanni can be used as a first assessment to see if there is a follow-up increase in chlorophyll or something. And I, I don't know if there's anyone going there to see what's happening or not. But I don't know. It's just I was wondering if there's any information about that. Uh, do you know anything? Very interesting comment. Good to see you. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, what I know is that uh, from previous years, we have very intense droughts and, and floods in the Amazon, and people have been correlating those climatic events with sea surface temperatures and anomalies in the tropical Atlantic. And some of those events, they also related to increasing fires and by mass burning. And there was another paper published by in Nature uh, relating also other uh, oceanic variables and indexes of those events. So let's say, so an impact from ocean variability into the fires in land. But what you are talking about is about the fires into the ocean. That's the feedback. So that's yeah. quite interesting. So what I, 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 don't, I don't think that there is someone looking into this, so you should look it into this. <laughs> yeah. However, uh, Giovanni is not that real time too. So you're going to take a, a month or two, maybe three, to get the data from there. But besides waiting for that, and I, and I know how curious you could be, <laughs> same for myself, maybe going to have to look into other data sources, which is a shame. But at the same time, it's true that uh, very recently, there are some events in Africa, such as the Sahara dust, which goes into the Gulf of Florida, as you already know, you know, aware of that. And also fires in in, in in African continent, they have flown over the Atlantic to the South America continent, changing uh, aerosol optical thickness and other atmospheric properties. So it's, it's already being studied by other fellows here. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so you gave a, a very interesting idea should we look into this. Uh, however, it, we don't have the data in near real time, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, it's, it must be hard. Also, it's a little bit far to yeah. travel all the way to the middle of the South Atlantic and see what's happening. Expensive. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, that's, yeah, maybe there's a, we're in September. Maybe the AMT is gonna catch some of this. Yeah, hopefully we'll see. Yeah. Thank you.